The way to think differently is to act differently and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast, where host Barry O'Reilly seeks to synthesize the superpowers of extraordinary individuals into actionable strategies you can use to think big, start small, and learn fast, and find your edge with excellence. Here's your host, Barry O'Reilly. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast. On this show, I'm delighted to be joined by Sachel Watson, an Executive Vice President for Digital Solutions for Business at Wells Fargo, one of the largest banks in North America with over 260,000 employees. You know, I've had the pleasure to work with Sachel over the last number of months and really learned some amazing techniques that she's brought to drive innovation, both in the retail side of banking, but also on the side of business banking. And on this show, we dive into questions around lessons she's learned about how she changes the way she's leading, customer insights and how she gathers them in a B2B type environment, how you bring product management to large organizations to have a massive impact, but also some of the motivation, safety and incentives that are required to help people be successful as they do so. It's a great show. So I'm really looking forward to sharing her experiences with you. So let's dive straight in. So the interesting part is that I've been in the digital space for 18 years, which is, if you think about it, a very early time when I joined Wells Fargo in the internet services group, which is what we called digital back then was internet and online very specifically. We still, I think, had horoscopes on the homepage of Wells Fargo (laughs) because we really didn't know what this technology was meant to do. So, you know, one of my first things was to make sure that we removed horoscopes and news and some of the other items off the homepage and let that be Yahoo's job at the time and really focus on what customers expected to see when they came to their banking portal. And because internet was so new, when I started looking at it, we were looking at it entirely with fresh eyes and trying to figure out a language to communicate to our customers on this new media. And with that, my passion was always towards customer experience. So we did a lot of human factors design research. We brought in the capabilities and the competency of doing user research and understanding customer tasks and understanding their behaviors and motivators and really putting that into the language. So user-centered design grew up as a discipline as I grew up within Wells Fargo as a digital channel manager. And so that's, I think, been the most kind of critical factor in my evolution as a channel manager, a product manager, is that I come from a user-centered design perspective because that was the thing that was primary and was the most missing when I started with digital 18 years ago. Nowadays, it's an entirely different story. We've had generations of new technology come in, generations of new people come into the industry with new innovations and new ideas both on the technology side, but also on the product and people side and process side as well. And so I see every day as a new day and I have so much more to learn. To hear you talk about actually capturing my thought about like 20 years ago, even the thought of humor centered design, like what was your intuition to start bringing those skills even to a digital space? Because I I don't really remember so many people thinking like that at that stage. Like what prompted you to start taking that approach? So my first assignment in 2002 was to make wellsfargo.com a buying site. And so the project was given to me as with the outcome of increasing sales on wellsfargo.com. And back then we didn't even really have an application to take deposit account applications yet. So it was a tall order to try to get a customer to learn enough about a product that they were used to accessing and acquiring from branches by talking to people or through our call centers to totally change their behavior and do it digitally. And the team was approaching it from a perspective of wanting to sell to customers, which was a kind yeah. of a push model, right? Yeah, Draw yeah, the yeah. In, a lot more banner ads and offers. And we wanted to really turn that language into customer needs. You know, why is the customer interested in a deposit account right now or a mortgage right now? What are the things that would be primary as their tasks when they're trying to get a bank account like this? What are their life scenario? What goals do they want to achieve when they 
get this financial product. So we really wanted to make it into a buying site as opposed to a sales site yeah. and change the language from one that was bank centric, where lines of businesses were marketing their wares to one that was customer centric. So we could talk a lot more about home ownership, new home, refinance, comparison charts for different kinds of checking for different kinds of audiences like students or people with brokerage accounts. And so we really wanted to change the architecture of the site to be much more customer driven. And that took a lot of research that had to span across different product groups. So we had to start funding things from a customer perspective as opposed to doing it siloed in line of business by line of business. Well, this is really interesting, right? Because I think most companies are even still struggling with the line of business, like project mentality, or where's my piece on the website, or where's my the things that matter to me on in the product. So, you know, if you jump forward to sort of today, what do you see then as some of those more on sort of unlearning moments you're having as you've sort of pushed your thinking from what listening to you is like, that's pretty pioneering perspective to have 20 years ago. Like, what are the kind of things you're thinking about more about today? Or what have you learned from? You know, right now I am blessed by having a product management team that is very savvy in terms of how we get the voice of the customer incorporated in how we build products and do new product development. But as a leader, one of my shortcomings has been that I have been providing initiatives for these product managers in terms of their product space. What I really wanted to change and unlearn was to try to staff people, not to products, but to outcomes. And that initially, when I positioned it that way to myself, it was really hard. So I recast it in a little bit easier manner. And I said, can I convince and enable my product managers who are now accountable for their product to instead see themselves as accountable for a broader outcome, one that would require them to partner with others, perhaps, to impact the outcome, but one that would get the bank or the customer experience to a better place. So I'll give you an example of that. I have an authentication product manager, and his initial goal for authentication, which is his product, was to migrate our business customers from using hard tokens for two-factor authentication to be able to use mobile tokens exclusively. Right now, the customers can use a hard token and they have an option to also use a mobile token, but we want them to migrate away from hard tokens and just use mobile tokens. So -hmm. this requires technology change for us. It also requires a customer behavior change and an adoption curve. But instead of having him think about this as a project, we recast it as an outcome. And so his outcome was, how do you simplify and accelerate our token distribution and management with X percent cost reduction and a Y percent increase for our customer satisfaction while also improving security? So when you have these constraint-based outcomes set out, then my product manager was able to see his job, his task as much broader. And so he had to partner not just with our technology team, but also with our operations team and customer onboarding teams so that he could really understand what was going on today when we were deploying these hard tokens to customers and come up with solutions. Yeah, he came back with a plan that included quick wins that had nothing to do with tech development. So things that could be done by changing manual processes and reducing costs immediately. But he also came up with a detailed plan that had a phased approach that could get us to savings every time we incremented towards our goal and allowed us also at the same time to learn. So instead of having one big X million dollar investment in this risky affair, he was able to break it down into phases where we would see some return with each incremental hundreds, thousands of dollars that we ended up spending on that project. What's great about this is It just hits so many points that I think many companies are facing today. Most companies are struggling to go from project-based work to product-based teams, right? That's a massive challenge for most companies already. But I think the ones that like really power ahead even don't get trapped in the the organizational or people movement of moving them from projects to product, but actually moving them, getting outcomes that people care about and then aligning people to the outcome for the work. 
the subtlety I think that many people probably even miss is when you go for outcomes, you actually, you know, you break the localized sort of incentive structure in many ways. Like if I'm on a project and I'm told to distribute tokens to people okay, and have it all done by the 1st of January, all I'm going to do is just keep focusing on, have I got tokens to 100,000 people? Have I got tokens to 100,000 people? And success or failure is just, did I do all of the tasks I said I would in the time frame and the budget? And it's very localized. It's a small perspective. But I think as you're describing what really stands out to me here with thinking about switching to an outcome that talks about cost savings, uh, customer satisfaction, improving security, it's actually thinking bigger. It's pushing up this outcome that lots of people can get behind. Loads of people would contribute to being successful. And then really you're putting it in the hands of the team to figure out what help they need which may mean some solutions are not any technology implementations whatsoever. They're process changes, they're policy changes, which can have a massive effect and sometimes don't even cost you much money. It's just redesigning something. Uh, So I think there's a, a lot for people to take away from that example and just recognize sort of where they're doing that. What was the hardest point for you then? You know, you mentioned you had to transition to this what were some of the things you found awkward or difficult? Or maybe, the, like, I'm sure you had pushback internally and you were sort of trying to say, well, let's not worry about what product you're responsible for. Why don't you start thinking about this outcome that the bank is aiming for? Like, that, that would be a tough transition to help people go through. What did you notice as you were doing that? I think it's a different way for people to engage with their peers across the organization. And there's a certain awkwardness when the project manager reaches out to operations and service and other teams and says, hey, you know, I got this mission from my boss. Can you help me? Because those folks are also thinking, well, that's kind of my job, but I'm really glad you're asking it because I've been having all these pains, but nobody really complained to them (laughs) about. And and so it creates a conversation And it can start awkwardly. You can feel like I'm stepping on someone's toes. What if they think that their current process is bad and I'm pointing a light on it? And so it really is important to, you know, approach these new partnerships with this perspective of, you know, we're just trying to move the needle. We're trying to make it better for the customer and for the bank. And we're on this kind of team together. And I just need your help to analyze the issue first. So you're not necessarily asking for buy-in to say, I need a team of five people for two years to deliver this project. That's where you get a lot of pushback. This is literally like saying, can you help me figure out if there's a problem or an opportunity here? If there isn't, great. We just had a conversation. If there is, let's do some more analysis. If there's something, then let's talk about, okay, what processes need to change? What team do we have to structure? What work do we have to get done? So again, it's incrementing almost in these like meeting by meeting or week by week ways to say, where are you in understanding the problem, associating some hypotheses with that problem and getting to that solutioning? So if you ask a little bit at a time from people, they're more willing to help. You know, if you ask for people's two-year commitment on an initiative and say, I need your team members to be part of my team. That's where I think get a lot more of the pushback. So the idea may be big, but this goes back to your starting small. I think in these partnerships, you also start small. I think that's a good enabler. That's great insight as well for folks to think about what the small steps are to get there. Is you know, because so many of these organizational sort of systems are like, what's your big plan? How's the project going to be? I need my priority is more important than yours. I need people to deliver this and you know, everyone sort of ends up getting in each other's way, really, that no work gets done. So I think it's really interesting that inside of really thinking bigger with big outcomes that everybody can get behind and and starting small with teams to sort of get there, I think is is awesome. So, you know, you also work in the B2B side of business finance and banking, right? And I can't tell you how many questions I get from people about any examples I always give, they're always like, no, but we're a business to business. We're different. We're unique. It's, it's, everyone thinks their side of the equation is tougher. So I'm curious for you, like as someone who spent both, you know, when you've been in 
the retail side of the bank and being very like B2C as you started off. And now you're in a sort of B2B type world and you're you know, servicing lots of businesses that rely on Wells Fargo for their banking. You know, what have some, been some of your other observations or in that sort of domain that you think are interesting and worth sharing? Yeah. So, you know, one of the uh, biggest charms of being on the B2B side after being in B2C for so long is the way that we acquire customer insights is a little different and, and more intuitive. I'll call it more old school. Since we have less customers, but deeper relationships with them, it's entirely possible for us to have a long-term relationship or even a professional friendship with a customer, with folks who work at a company who's our customer, and you know, allow them to be our advisors on a longer term basis. So instead of having this kind of survey feedback, you know, instant kind of short question answer interface with a customer to get their insight, you know, we're able to have sit down conversations with our customers. So what I found as a really good tool to know your impact on the customer on the consumer side was Net Promoter Score. I think it's a great tool. Would you recommend us to your colleagues is a great question to ask at the B2B side as much as it is on the B2C side. But what we can do because we can have these conversations with our customers over a longer period of time is we can also go beyond and ask them a different question that I found to be really telling. And that question is, how do you feel? So I could be asking this in relation to a new process that we've created or a new web functionality that we built or how the customer uses their mobile device to run their business. Whatever the context of the question is, how do you feel elicits a much deeper answer than are you satisfied or would you recommend? How do you feel is something where you're literally letting the customer use their heart as well as their mind to answer the question. And in the process of doing it, you get a lot more color. And I'm also then able to ask the question why. And I can ask the question as many times as I want to try to get down to a deeper meaning and a deeper need or a desire or a business problem that the customer may be having. So I find B2B to be super exciting. And I feel that it allows us to actually have these deeper, more meaningful insight conversations with our customers about our products and services. Yeah, I really like this sentiment too as well, because one of the constant pushbacks, especially when people are working in B2B, is they always say, you know, we don't have millions of customers that we can run an A-B test on and find out quantitatively in 24 seconds if which landing page is better. And we've got serious customers and we can't risk the relationship with them. And yet what I'm hearing you say, and it reminds me of many other sort of companies, I think you do this really well, is that the relationship actually gets stronger when you reach out to these customers who you do have long standing business relationships with and ask them like, how can we make the service better? Or we're trying to build these sort of new features that we think could have a massive benefit for you and other customers, but we want to start working with one or two of you people first to build out what this service potentially could be. I find when you actually frame it in that types of terms, you actually build deeper relationship actually with your customers because you're you're sort of showing up recognizing that what you're doing could get better. And actually, you want them to participate in that process rather than sort of to be enforcing, now, this is the way we're going to do business. And if you want to work with us, that's sort of the way it has to be. So I think, again, counterintuitively, it's actually a stronger position to go to a couple of your key business partners and invite them into your beta testing process or interviews, as you've described, to ask how you can really, you know, make these services better and asking those questions like, how do you feel? You're frustrated. Why? You're disappointed with the quality service. Why? Something's working really well. You've actually been exceeded our expectations here. Why did that happen? I think they're so powerful, but I think sometimes companies in the B2B space tend to hide behind the, well, we don't have volumes of people that we can just test with and 
show them unperfected products. Everything has to be perfect. We show these partners because we've so few of them, we can't risk the relationship. And I feel like it's counterintuitive actually to actual better approach it is to show what you're doing because it builds more trust and actually de-risks more of your relationship. What are your thoughts and experiences yeah. there? I agree. I think part of it, the extreme aspect of this is I call it co-creation. And, and we have actually some capabilities to be able to co-create with customers. So for example, we have a gateway, which is our API channel that allows our customers or partners to be able to take our code and run it within their systems and allows us to be more open to partnerships. But one of the things that the gateway channel enables us to do is to be able to co-create with customers if we need to. So the customer can give us their requirements. We have an API that we publish and then they test it and then they say X and Y didn't work. Let's change these things. And we could be building an API as if it's custom only for that customer. But really we're trying to get it right for one customer at the minimum before we can then productize it for a group of customers where this could be applicable. Because the truth about any product is that if it's not good for one person or one company, it's not going to be good for a majority of your target audience. So if you feel like you've got the right target audience with that customer, co-creation is a great method, as you said, to innovate and to de-risk the innovation. The other thing that I will say is a motivator that is super strong for the people who are working on these initiatives. So if I go to a customer, get their deep feedback about an area that I manage, and then I know that I'm going to see that customer next year during the conference, then before that conference arrives, right, I'm much more eager to make sure that I've fixed those things or I have a story to tell around the improvements that we made because I know I'm now liable to get back to that customer and explain them how their feedback helped us move forward. And so yeah. you almost feel like you can owe it to a specific person to be successful, to move the dial, as opposed to kind of think of your customer as this unnamed masses out there. You can kind of put a face on your customer and say, oop, they're going to call me up. And what do I have to tell them next time? It's so funny. You're, you're reminded me of a company I work with called ATP Co. And they basically run all the data for the airline industry. So what they do is they suck all the information about every airline, everything from the size of their seats to the ways you can change tickets and so forth. And they act as an aggregator between the airlines so they can compare and contrast their products to one another. Their customers are all the airline groups. And you know one of the things we do every year, it's funny, you mentioned this at their customer conference, they would literally sit down and like invite some of the customers to come along and they would show them some of these like pilot initiatives or even just like back of a napkin ideas that they were thinking about that would have some potential potentially for these customers. And it was a really interesting way for them to filter to find out who were the partners that actually had the sort of sort of a mindset to say, look, we'll go on this journey with you where you might offer us an API or some functionality that's not perfect, but it could get us a portion of the way towards this idea that we think that could be valuable and build it with us. And it's funny then that those customer sort of roadshows or events would be sort of through the year and the, the people would really look forward, not only the team to showing that partner, like how far the product or the idea had moved, but it was, a, it was an interesting way to like bring them in to sort of talk about and share, you know, what other ideas that they had seen. It's really funny that you, when you share that to me, it just reminds me of what a powerful technique that was for them as a company as well. So for you then, you know, Wells Fargo, you know, you've got over a quarter of a million employees. I don't know how many companies are really that big left in the world with so many employees. So what have been some of your insights both learnings and unlearnings on trying to bring product management, which still I think is a discipline that's still forming itself into such a large organization. Like, What have been some of your observations from your work in the bank over the last number of years there? Yeah. Yes, we do have about 260,000 people. So it's definitely a large company. 
And the benefit of being large is that it allows us to have the internal resources, the budget, the people to build better solutions for our customers. And because naturally we also have a large customer base, when we are actually successful and have something in the market, we are set to have a huge impact on our customer lives, on even the U.S. economy in general. To give you kind of a size example, you know, we touch one in five businesses in the U.S. We have customers, consumer customers in every zip code. But on the kind of drawback side of things, we also need to do things carefully and we are under a lot of different regulations and risk management is really critical for a bank. So unfortunately, it does take us about 100 people to deliver any project. And so, as you said, product management is a discipline where they quarterback these initiatives typically and make sure that we're moving along with a roadmap that is consistently and constantly delivering some utility and some success in outcomes. And most of the product manager time right now is spent bringing new people up to speed as they join a project. So, you know, you may start with a few people, but up to a point the first five people know really well why we're doing this project. The next 95 have to still learn it the day that they join the project. And it's a definite cost to the organization to have to go through so many people to deliver something. Yeah. But on the positive side, this year I had a very unique experience, one that was not planned, but as with anything, you know, we are able to uh, learn from experience. This one was more trial by fire. The Small Business Administration and our government asked all the banks that offer loans to businesses to offer the Paycheck Protection Program loan applications online so that they could provide grants for small businesses up to $10 million for them to deal with the impacts of the pandemic, COVID. But they only gave us a few days of notice to do so. So everyone knows digital makes things fast, but being able to provide a loan application in a matter of days is not easy. (laughs) And I don't think it was prior to this done at the scale that not just Wells Fargo, but all the other banks who participated ended up doing it. And to add to it, nobody was sure that the government would have enough grant money for everybody. So our customers were eager. This was life and death for them and their businesses to put an application as quickly as possible before the money ran out. Now, we ended up actually having ample money for everyone who needed it in the program for the time being that the government was sponsoring the grants, but we didn't know that when we started the program. So on a Saturday, literally days after hearing our marching orders from the government, Wells Fargo launched an application of interest form online and there was huge demand. And so within hours on that Saturday, we had a long list of customer issues. So I got tapped by relationship managers who had been on the phone with their customers all morning to help out. And that weekend, I don't think I left my chair or my phone for about 72 hours. Like a Zoom Zoom fatigue record. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. There were so many issues that came up that I had to act really fast and I couldn't do this by myself. So what I did is I played the switchboard. I made a list of questions to be answered and I made a list of tasks to be done for each of these issues. Mm. And then I kept on calling people I know in the bank with only one specific question. And the question was, who can best help me answer this question or do this task? Mm. So remember, this is a weekend, but due to COVID, everybody was always home. (laughs) They were always on. Yeah. So in each case, after a handful of phone calls, I was able to find the best people in the large organization to be able to do these tasks. So it took maybe 10 people to do all these tasks around all these issues to try to recover and remediate the situation for our customers. After that, you know, we had a little bit more time to do things in a more kind of orderly fashion. But what this experience made me realize is that it doesn't take more than 10 people to do things, but you have to get the right 10 people. And that's where we typically fail. The reason why we have 100 people in the project is we don't know who those right 10 people are. So if we start initiatives by more of this question 
aspect and break things down into issues and tasks and problems or questions, unknowns, right? And say, who can answer these? Before we staff initiatives, then I think we can get less people occupied for a more intensive period to run with answering those questions or delivering those tasks. So it's a really different way of organizing talent, but it's hard to kind of make that switch in the kind of big system that I'm in on a day-to-day basis. In fact, the example, you know, I always give when I talk about this is kind of the, the movie Ocean's Eleven, where, you know, the thieving community finds people with different skills to try to steal the uh, money out of the casinos. And there's a gymnast. And for half the movie, you're wondering, what are they going to do with the gymnast? And then it becomes obvious because they need somebody to catapult onto the, the safe without triggering the lasers. And for us, when we start an initiative, we don't know who the gymnast is. We don't know if we need a gymnast. We don't know who the gymnast is. And so getting those facts takes us the 100 people. The question I have right now is how do I do it differently and how do I get to those right 10 people quickly and not waste the other 90 people's time in an initiative? Yeah, it's it's a fascinating technique you're describing there. Like I really like this, like the way what I'm interpreting you're saying is like you're literally were doing customer development calls. Like people were asking you or coming to you a question saying they've got these problems and how do we solve them? and the intuition you had to sort of capture these things as questions or what are the most important questions to answer and what actions do we need to take to try and de-risk these questions, issues and so forth. And then who's the right person? I feel like that's almost like this sort of customer discovery technique being applied to process problems and finding ways to prioritize and sort what the most important needs actually are and then who could be the people to fulfill that need. It's really interesting to hear you describe that sort of response and then really how you can turn that into a more effective solution instead of just saying we have a project, get me the the hundred people that can actually potentially be available, never mind are they the right people to solve these problems and set them to march rather thinking about what can we be very clear about what the needs are here and actually have a smaller group of people who fit these needs really well, and then, you know, let them sort of go to work solving these challenges that matter to us. And I think there's a lot to learn there, even just about how people construct teams on a daily basis. You know, so many of the, you know, what I observe in companies is it's it's not so deliberate or intentional about how they staff projects. They just have these, well, we, we always have to have an engineer and a tester and we always have, you know, we have these fixed roles. We just plug them in and then we throw requirements at them and those people go execute the requirements and talent, there's always a talent shortage of some description because there's some new technology that one person knows how to use in a company of thousands. And I think it's really interesting to take more of a, a problem focused approach, recognize what the most pressing questions or or uncertainties are. Think of the tasks that might need to be done to de-risk them a little bit and have a smaller team explore them. I think people need to think a little bit more like that. And they probably have much more success. They may get more things done because they have smaller teams operating more autonomously rather than these big chunk, 100-person teams that are quite rigid and not as fungible maybe in some respects. Right. I feel like, you know, every time there's a sheet music in front of us, we call the whole orchestra. Mm. And sometimes the music is written for a quintet. (laughs) That's a really much more eloquent way to say what I was trying to say. Awesome. You know, if we go back to these notions of some of the, you know, your shift again to this idea of outcomes and even at the top of the, the show, right through to this idea of these problems and sorting them. And what have been some of the other little sort of shifts that you have made in that space then around both setting outcomes and handing them to teams to deliver and finding the right people to you know fill those spots. Is, is there any other examples that come to mind that you've sort of learned over the last couple of months, especially through COVID and, and the PPP crisis? And, you know, as a bank, obviously trying to deal with, you know, regulatory and fraud opportunities. Any, yeah. Anything jump to mind? 
Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, our industry is one where our jargon changes, but the concepts behind the jargon sometimes remain the same. So, you know, I started yeah, nice. e-commerce, internet, then it became digital, digitization, right? In the area of kind of setting goals and objectives, you know, we used to have more kind of the strategies, goals, objectives type alignment on an annual basis. And then it was key performance indicator, which were more rolling. And now we have OKRs. And, you know, when we're looking at those key results, like how do we look at them? How do we talk about them? How do we put them on a balanced scorecard? And those are the things that have been kind of evolving in our product management lives over the last couple of decades. And I totally agree that, you know, as you said, we need to be able to have measurable outcomes to evaluate how we're doing, learn from our mistakes, improve, you know, see if the projects and the investment we're putting into them is hitting the mark. And all of this is critical for us, for businesses, for our teams. But one of the things that I noticed more broadly, not just in my team, but in the industry, especially with startups, is that there's a congruence of how people do performance reviews and compensation for their people as they tie into OKRs. And now you can say, you know, for some groups like sales, where, you know, if you sell, you get more commission-based compensation, that makes more sense. But in product management, which doesn't have as clear-cut a success definition as sales, I think that could be detrimental. So while I like OKRs a lot, I really don't like them when they are tightly coupled to performance reviews and compensation. So when I look at OKRs or KPIs, I'm trying to compare teams or people to one another, but I'm only trying to do that from a management science perspective. I want to know how teams are doing. I want to understand if there's a problem that the teams may not visualize, and I want to be able to help them. So I want them to learn from the data. I don't want them to be penalized or recognized for the data. Because if we do that, if people know they're being measured, they will cheat the system, sometimes do it unintentionally. They'll get competitive, and then team trust levels will go down. They will hide their failures. They will blame others, right? They will try to make sure that they're performing best right before performance review time. So the way I see it, the more we look at OKRs as a way to compensate people, the worse it gets. I feel like our competition should be with our true competition, right? If it's Wells Fargo, it's with JP Morgan Chase or Goldman or whoever else. And we're competing for the attention of our customers. We're competing for the customer share or wallet. I don't want my people or my teams to compete with each other. And I find that to be a really dangerous, slippery slope when OKRs drive product managers' performance and compensation. This is a pattern I think many people need to be aware of and caution for sure. I think any moment that a directional objective becomes a target where you'll be either rewarded heavily or penalized heavily, I think it just leads to really negative behavior all around, right? Everything from people trying to game the system to themselves, or they actually lowball their targets to make sure that they hit them. And rather than set audacious goals and try and get, you know, 50, 60% of the way towards them, which actually creates huge innovation, people just stick to what's known and lowball. And then nothing really changes, right? You're forcing a status quo. This is my fundamental observation as well. If people are in a situation where, you know, you tell them you get a couple of percent improvement and you'll get a big bonus, what are they going to do? Are they just going to try and sweat and squeeze like the existing process to get them over the line? Are they going to do something innovative or novel to not just get the couple of percent they might need, but like maybe 10, 30 percent higher than that and something radically different, which is riskier? Everyone sticks with what's comfortable to them. And that doesn't bring innovation into your company. And it's one of these, again, counterintuitive things is pay for performance or where people are treated like that actually inhibits innovation uh, counterintuitively. And that was a great I, chapter. I chapter 12 yeah. and Unlearn is all about that, which is, uh, yeah, it's always a good, good one to get in there. Yeah, that's very true. And, you know, I'll give you kind of an example in a very quantitative team that I manage. It's not sales, but it's fraud management. So you try to prevent fraud. 
We try to recover monies if they're gone for our customers. And, you know, that team obviously is very metrics driven, but they look at their metrics to try to learn because fraud patterns, fraud vectors change dramatically over time. Our competition is with the fraudsters. Our competition is not within my team. So what I want to make sure that team does is never reward or criticize individuals in the teams for doing something in a certain way. So what we do is every single time we have a large fraud case, whether we have prevented it or and caught it or caught it and then recovered it or couldn't, and we ended up losing the funds for our customer, we look at each case and the team gets together as a team and discusses it. And they're trying to look and see if the alerts fired correctly, if our AI was working the way that we intended it, if we worked the case according to our process, if the analyst intuition was right or not. And if there's a feedback then we are able to then provide that feedback up the chain to the analysis team or to the investigations team so that we could do better next time. We could try to ask the question, why did this happen? Why were we successful? Why did we fail? So we can learn from it. But we want to learn from it as a group. We don't want to use that tool to say to the analyst, you missed this one. You fell asleep on the job. Because the first time you do that, right, then you're losing the confidence of the analyst. So they're not going to be even as confident next time to make that risky call, right? So instead of actually giving feedback where it's due, you're creating an environment where your feedback may unintentionally create even worse performance outcomes. So for us, for the fraud team, it's really important that we win collectively and we lose collectively and we look at the data. So there's transparency, there is facts-based analysis. It's not just gut feeling and slapping each other in the back, but we don't single out individuals because we believe that by looking at this data, people learn. There is nothing more we could do to make that a better team other than enable them to learn. I don't think performance motivators, if they're compensation oriented, are going to get the team to make magic. <laughs> Their ju- you know, judgment on these fraud cases is only as good as what they can possibly make it be. I think the standout point that's really, for me here, is how you're talking about not focusing on individual error, but actually focusing on your, you know, your system error. And how can we make sure this doesn't happen again in our system, whether it's a process, whether it's a technology change we need to make? Like That's where the real learning happens. When you start to think about how you can improve your systems to catch it next time rather than just focused on this one person and how they failed and and let's sort of chastise them and feel good about ourselves for a minute. But it only leads to further suppression and fear in the team. So I, I think it's such a great example. So just one thing I'd like to ask you then, you know, like you've given us so many of these great examples and everything from dealing with PPP to being a B2B company and and really making this shift to be more like truly outcome-based, not just projects to products, but like think about outcomes that everyone in the company can get behind and whether you're delivering a product or whether you're actually trying to learn and improve your systems through performance and management and so forth. What are some of the things, especially as, uh, you know, even of the observations you've dealt with in your business with COVID related, all, all these sorts of things, what are you sort of most excited about now in the future? What are you sort of looking forward to that you think you, you maybe learned from the last sort of year or so, or maybe even just a trend that you think that's emerging and kind of unique or interesting? I'll give an answer that is probably not one you were expecting, but you know, one of the things I noticed, this new way of talking about strengths of individuals is, you know, you say, you know, what's that person's superhuman strength or, you know, what's their superhero strength, right? And I realized product management is one of those disciplines where they're able to create that drive. So initiate something from nothing and get a program moving in a large company faster than other groups that may be more functionality driven, right? So finance, HR, et cetera. And I see that there's this proclivity towards having a product management discipline now more embedded in these traditionally kind of discipline-oriented groups, HR, finance, compliance. And I see that as a positive trend. And one example I'll give you within my own team is actually how we were approaching 
our own diversity and inclusion initiatives. So Wells Fargo broadly has a diversity and inclusion umbrella of initiatives. And within it, different business units, such as commercial banking, which is what I'm a part of, also has their own charters for diversity and inclusion. But as you would appreciate, everything happens at the uh, local level. And so I wanted to make sure that my team also had local initiatives that were targeted towards my team very specifically. So as I gathered a few people based on the conversation of this year, which was around allyship and Black Lives Matter principles and how we are going to be applying them broadly into our diversity and inclusion efforts, I did that Ocean's Eleven thing I talked about. I just you know, grabbed literally a few individuals and said, you guys help us try to think through these issues and be part of my leadership team in doing so. And so interestingly, they had just gone through our product management reskilling efforts with you, Barry, uh, which, mm. as you know, we call Move the Needle. And they suggested that we come up with a visualization of what we want the end product to be. And so one of the folks on my team, Gwen, she basically came up with a newsletter. And when I saw the newsletter, I was like, wait a minute, did we do these things? Because it looked so real to me that I actually thought like, wait, like there was already these things happening and I just didn't know about it. But it was a great way to show what she envisioned the future should be like. And based on that newsletter as a visualization tool, then we were able to come back and say, okay, so what are the hypotheses, right, that you have? What are the beliefs that you have today? And what do we want to change? And how can we programmatize our efforts to get to that newsletter as an outcome that basically says, you know, that our Black African-American team members feel very engaged, they feel appreciated, they feel heard, there's a strong sense of allyship in our community, and they have the right sponsors and mentors, and they know that their career progression is one that they can feel hopeful about, that they are getting paid equitably and our pay strategies are transparent and that our entire team is aware and informed about Black African-American history, U.S. history, and even banking history when it comes to how banking has historically treated underrepresented minorities. And so being able to do this kind of product management skill set on an atypical area was very exciting for me. And, you know, we're still working on these initiatives. It's very new to kind of tell the success stories, but I feel like the next stage for product management is to be embedded in these other areas in an institution that aren't seen as the cost of goods sold product management, but are more in the SGNA part of the balance sheet or the uh, income statement. Yeah, no, it's a fabulous example. A lot of these skills are very much a mindset, right? I think they shouldn't just be tied to a role, but rather these are capabilities that people can build in themselves. And whether you're working on really important initiatives like raising the voices of minorities in your organization to how you change, you do your financing. I think everybody can take these sort of principles and methods and apply them to build, you know, just better experiences for people. And I think that's phenomenal to hear. Yeah. Well, look, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I know you're a super busy person at the moment with so much happening in this space. So thank you for joining us and sharing all your stories. I really appreciate it. And again, thanks very much.